Thank you to the George W. Bush Institute for that excellent message and video. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Anand Parikh. I'm the Chief Medical Advisor at the Bipartisan Policy Center, and with Blaze, the co-director of our work on strategic health diplomacy. We have two excellent panels for you today. Uh, the first will feature Senator Daschle and Senator Frist. As Blaze mentioned, the two authors of the report being released by the Bipartisan Policy Center today. Our second panel will feature Ambassador Deborah Burks, General Charles Wold, and Ambassador Mark Sterella. Both panels will be taking questions, so please raise your hand if you have a question during the Q&A period, and we'll have roving microphones, and we'll, we'll get those to you. And so at this time, it's my honor to invite Senators Daschle and Frist to the stage, along with our moderator for our first panel discussion, Michael Gerson. Michael is a senior advisor to ONE, an advocacy organization that works to end extreme poverty and preventable disease, particularly in Africa. Michael is also a columnist for the Washington Post and previously served as the assistant to the president for policy and strategic planning under President George W. Bush. Thank you to all of you. And Michael, I'll, I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you. That's appreciated. It's an honor to be with you all. Um, PEPFAR was my best experience in government. And one reason the program is exceptional is because of its bipartisan nature. nature. It spanned the gap between social conservative and traditionally liberal global health advocates. It spanned the gap between parties. And it spanned the gap between administrations with President Obama deeply committed to this effort. Um, so PEPFAR has been a haven, a safe harbor from the bitterness of our politics. And these two men represent how government can work in a great national cause. They turned the idea of PEPFAR into reality and they remain its tireless advocates. So good to be with you. Thank you. It's often said that PEPFAR, as the largest investment a country has ever made in combating a single disease, is one of the most successful global efforts in terms of its scale and impact. The program celebrates its 15th year this May, which means that some people in the audience may not know about the pre-PEPFAR period, can you remind us what things were like for people living with HIV in the early 2000s in some of the hardest hit areas? Tom, you want to jump? Sure. Well, first of all, Michael, let me just compliment you uh, for all of your work and leadership. You were one of the inspirations. You were one of the true organizers. And I think uh, for the record and for those who may not know the history, Michael had a lot to do with the fact that uh, it was successful as it was. And secondly, the man on my left was just incredible. I, it was a real pleasure to work with him on that uh, extraordinary effort. And uh, But going to your question, Michael, I would say that people started to die of HIV AIDS in the 60s. But by uh, the year 2000, right around the time that the Bush administration uh, took office, uh, over 25 million people had lost their lives. There were countries in Africa where 20% of those uh, living in these countries had been affected, uh, infected, and, and so it was becoming more and more widespread. There was an enormous social stigma attached to the disease, and so people were reluctant to even become uh, engaged medically or, uh, or organizationally. And there was a lot of confusion about what was right, what was wrong, what was the, what was the truth about the issue. And that led, of course, to an enormous uh, degree of confusion just generally about how we approach the issue. The final thing I, I think I would say initially would be how expensive the cost of the medicine was. $125 uh, dollars a month uh, with, with marginally effective uh, uh, treatment initially. That compares now to around $6 with a dramatically improved quality of care. So things have changed a lot. But it was really dire in that, uh, that period right after the turn of the century. Senator Frist, I remember visiting South Africa in shanty towns where you would see grandparents and grandchildren with an entire generation nearly gone. Talk about what you saw in that period. Michael, it, it, it is exactly right. That image that, that you just laid, this layering out, is one that, to me, I, I uh, think best dramatizes what was happening. It was a hollowing out of, of society 
where when you traveled around in the 90s, where I spent a lot of time, I spent two to three weeks in Africa somewhere, some kind of doing medical work during that period of time from through the 1990s and through 2000. And in the 90s, in the mid 90s, literally you would see grandmothers and you'd see little babies and you would see no sort of middle age, nobody above sort of adolescent years of women, of girls, of, of men because of this hollowing out. Now eventually no, we knew the virus would come down and, and create over 11 million, coming back to the, the time of the early 2000, 11 million orphans, HIV orphans. But initially it was that hollowing out. The virus, I first um, began looking at, thinking about 1981 when there were only five cases in the United States. I was a resident at, at Mass General in, in Boston at that time. Nobody had ever talked about the virus at all because we didn't know it existed. And although 1981 seems like a long time ago to me, uh, it doesn't seem like it's a very long time ago uh, today. And then that year a few thousand people died. We still didn't know what the virus was. And then the next year, 2,000 2, people died. And then within about three or four years, uh, three million people died in the world. For, remember, from a handful to three million. And over that period of time, Africa was especially hit. It started there in the 1960s. And by the time of the 1990s, when I started to go there, the eight, th this virus, which had been defined by our NIH about 1983, cagey little virus, Every time you get a treatment for it, it changes conformation and therefore it escapes treatment. And to this day, we don't have that treatment. Um, but what it was doing was hauling out society. It was getting, it was hitting the military. It was hitting the civil servants. It was hearing, uh, hitting the politicians, the people who would keep civil society safe. It was that hollowing out that in the 1990s and really up until the 2000s too, PEPFAR was the reality that we all had to face. Yeah, I remember seeing a lot of child-headed households that affected families. Mark Dybald talks about seeing child-headed villages where there were no village elders left. Um, really extraordinary. But then the drugs start arriving. Um, you had, at the time, what was called the Lazarus Effect. Um, can you describe that period, the, how the hope advanced in the aftermath of PEPFAR? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in just because it was so real. So I would spend two, three weeks, even as majority leader and when I was in the United States Senate, taking off my political hat, but going and doing medical mission work. Uh, went to about 14 different countries during the period of the 90s and, and through the 2000s. And it, early on, it was really called VCT, Voluntary Counseling and Testing. Why? Because as, as, as um, we talk about generally, the costs were so high, not just of the drugs, but of the tests themselves. There were just no tests for it. And then the antiretroviral, which was sort of the miracle drug, as Tom said, was costing about $8,000 a treatment. So to Americans and people across the world, with 3 million people dying every year, 20 million people infected at $10,000, people said it was impossible. But then, and again, it'll go into the PEPFAR story, we had some political movement, we had our industry, we had our pharmaceutical companies all come, come forward. Why? Because all of a sudden the cost started coming down, the antiretroviral started coming, and in a place like Botswana, where life expectancy had been around 60, and then through the 80s and 90s, it had come down to 38 years of age in, in, in uh, Botswana. Then all of a sudden, through American leadership and PEPFAR coming in, it came back up, and eventually, and we'll get there in terms of the story, it's back to about 62 years of age, and that's a Lazarus effect. That's pretty extraordinary. What did you see as far as in the aftermath of PEPFAR? Well, I think the, the, the most exciting thing you see is that uh, people are getting their lives back. On a personal level, people were actually becoming uh, more optimistic about their life, about their future, about their communities. Uh, you saw economic growth and prosperity re restored, as Bill was noting. I, you know, I, I think one of the greatest impediments to employment and economic growth is illness. And when you see the widespread impact that HIV AIDS had across the, across the spectrum, uh, you saw a resulting uh, decimation of the economy. And then a resulting, and then from that, 
a decimation of the stability of governance itself. I mean, there was, there was a great deal of uncertainty about how stable these governments were going to remain given the tremendous volatility and turmoil that existed as a result of all of this, this uncertainty. And, 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 and I would also add deep psychological pain. I mean, there was a stigma, as I said earlier, that really was so pervasive. And that also affected society in a very profound way. But as soon as PEPFAR came along, as soon as we actually could see some real results, hope and optimism, confidence began to be restored. And that had a, just a, a catalytic effect on the economy, on stability and governance, and the capacity once again to restore some degree of normalcy in many of the countries in Africa especially. And Michael, I think that hopelessness, and I, which I'm sure we'll hear about in the next panel and this panel, but again, this sense of time and place, um, uh, especially post 9-11, but even the 1990s, Bin Laden, again, I'll be corrected by the next panel, I think left Sudan in that area in the mid-1990s, but part of the hopelessness when you are a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old and you just see no hope, not just because you're poor or you're living in a little too cold or you don't have a home where there's bad sanitation, but you have no hope because you have death and destruction and chaos and your father has died and your mother has died. And then all of a sudden somebody comes in and gives you that little element of hope, of life. That is probably one of the best antidote of the time. Remember, not after when 9-11 hit and terrorism was, was rampant, at the time, if you were given hope of a future, of being able to have a family, take care of your family, put a roof over their head, send your daughter to school where you didn't have it three years before, that is a powerful, powerful antidote to whether it's terrorism or what I call peace, using health and medicine as a currency for peace. This, by the way, it was also interesting how treatment encouraged testing where you would talk to people who said, I know it's not a death sentence now, so I'm gonna go be tested because there's hope. Um, and it really expanded that element, which was necessary. Um, you know, treatment uh, really was important to testing. I, I wanna get to a point that Senator Daschle made that's a focus of the report, which is the effect on um, socioeconomic gains um, in these countries. A lot of, uh, this has not gotten as much attention in terms of GDP per, uh, per capita growth and worker productivity, in terms of the ability of people living with, with AIDS to become employed. Um, how does supporting development countries with access to HIV treatment result in improved development? Well, I think it, I would say there are at least three major components to it. First of all, as I said earlier, the, the, the fact that you have such pervasive and widespread uh, illness uh, affects the capacity for employment itself. So unemployment necessarily is going to go up dramatically. Uh, the reverse is true. Once you find ways with which to address that illness and, and make people healthy, unemployment goes down, uh, people are beginning to develop a, a capacity for work again, and that has profound economic consequences. So it starts with that, that realization that, uh, that there is a direct connection between being healthy and having a healthy and strong economy. But then it goes beyond that. You've also got to, to create greater capacity, uh, and that capacity can be built through improvements in infrastructure, and PEPFAR did that. PEPFAR helped enhance the infrastructure within any country uh, to address not only the, the challenges of the illness, but really the whole concept of making a healthier society more productive again. And that was a very big part of what I think uh, what people began to see. There have been studies done showing the correlation between presence of PEPFAR and economic growth and vitality. Clear connection between um, the strength of the program and the strength of the economy, South Africa in particular, but there are many other countries. So we've seen an enormous appreciation of what this can do, and it has uh, macroeconomic effects that we're still beginning to, are still uh, today uh, appreciating uh, now 15 years after the fact. And uh, Senator Frist, um, Africa is a major trading partner of the United States as well. The, re the report points out that it, there's about $40 billion in trade in 2016. Four of the top five partners in the region are countries that have been major PEPFAR partners. Um, 
Can you explain the links between PEPFAR investments in public health and the growth of, and these, of these and other trading partners? Yeah, I think, I think trade is a good sort of surrogate or, or corollary or additional point of what, what Tom was talking about. And this report, unlike our report five years ago, we go much more into this sort of economic development. When, when Tom and I were leading in, in the Senate in the evolution of this bill, which passed very quickly in a strongly bipartisan way, which, I, you know, I smile just because of where we are today, but in a strong bipartisan way coming in. It was months, right? It was Between months. The it was, the it was January, State months. of the Union yeah. message. The president, who we just uh, heard from, unbeknownst to 99.9% .9 of the people, even his own Secretary of Health at the time, uh, made that statement, and then within six months, the whole bill was passed, wrapped up, and worked with the House of Representatives. But the, but even then, in our first report, we didn't concentrate on this sort of socioeconomic GDP growth, trade growth, which this report actually does uh, a lot more. We The sort of impact of HIV AIDS is as much as 4% fall in GDP because of this one little KG virus and its impact. So obviously, if you can reverse that, and add to it hope and optimism and employment, as Tom mentioned, it can be explosive. The other thing our report does, which, which you mentioned, is looks at uh, the impact on trade. So not just, not just health and productivity in a community or in a region, but in a country and then impact on other countries. And you mentioned the four out of five of our biggest traders uh, what happened to be the, our most important PEPFAR partners coming forward, where we invested the most uh, over time. So we look at that correlation, but it's pretty obvious because once you have, as Tom said, better em employment in a community, you give hope to a community, you have young people who are less interested in fighting and causing trouble because all of a sudden they look to a hopeful future. You have 10 roofs over a house and girls going back to school because they don't have this threat of predators themselves. You have a country that has shared with the United States and its leadership. This wasn't the U.S. flying in and putting Americans on the ground and doing it. These were partnerings. These were taking local people, sharing information with them, using their ideas, and building an infrastructure, not just in the capital city, but throughout that whole country, wherever you go, the smallest little community. The smallest one I'd travel to and do surgery in There'd be three or four little kids, and I'd say, what's your name? And they'd say, America. <laughs> I'd say, America? And they'd say, yes, my parents named me America because of this thing that they've done for, they didn't say HIV AIDS, but that kind of impact. And then the last thing is the governance itself. Um, because it's a partnering and it is resources going in, one of the things that the U.S. and our global partners and our military, everybody involved, insisted upon is a degree of transparency, is a degree of participation, is a degree of, of, of the sort of ideals that are exactly the sort that you want that government to have if they're going to be a trading partner. You don't want to be trading with somebody who you can't work with, you can't trust, who's not transparent. And so using health as this tool, this instrument, all of a sudden this transparency came through government and this legitimacy of, of government working with our government meant more and more trade over time. Uh, PEPFAR has been described as an expression of American values in the tradition of the Marshall Plan, the Peace Corps. Um, this report um, talks about how PEPFAR is associated with more positive public opinion of U.S. leadership in countries where it is invested heavily. What do you think are the attributes of this program that contribute to these favorable views of the United States? I think if I could start, Michael, by saying, I, I think, first of all, just the, the impression that people have about the U.S. as a compassionate and a generous country, uh, but also a country that has, has a capacity to, to work with people. You know, I, I think one of the values, uh, while I, I give great credit to our diplomats in, in all countries, they, they deserve our thanks and our praise and our gratitude for all that they do. This goes beyond what a single embassy can do because it's so widely dispersed. It's in the communities themselves. And it really carries to the very core, the grassroots of these communities, uh, the real values that America represents at its best. Uh, you know, in these communities, in the in the churches, and in the in the uh, the, 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 the local community centers, in the clinics, um, that representation, that physical 
uh, understanding of the generosity and compassion of the American people is very evident. And I think that makes a big difference. I mean, there's a great story of a young kid who said he saluted every day when he went by the clinic because there was an American flag. And he would thank the United States for its uh, commitment to him and his health. And I think the other thing that would that would really contribute as well is, is the fact that so much local talent is being used. It isn't Americans coming in uh, with, with uh, nothing but people from Washington or, uh, or New York. These are local people helping local people, helping their families, helping their communities, but, giving, but being given the resources and given the, 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 the know-how, the, the technological capacity to help. So that local talent is a big factor as well. Senator Frist, why is it important that the world views America favorably for our diplomats, for our security in other areas? It's a great question. And again, we didn't go into it. I'm going back to those days in, in um, 2003 at that State of the Union message and our discussions on the floor. It's not why we went into it. It really was a public health, global health hollowing of society. And that was the really thrust of it. It really was a moral imperative. It doesn't matter where you're born, whether it's in the United States or Ethiopia or Sudan or South Africa, that if you were struck down by a disease, you should be lifted up. And you should never live in fear. It never in, in the 21st century live in fear of a virus striking you down because of a lack of, of, of attention. But the impact ultimately has been just that. We've had the socioeconomic impacts, the impact on trade itself. Our, our ambassadors, one of the great things we did in the report uh, that we take credit for, but that we heard that, that our team did, was to talk to the ambassadors themselves. And again, we'll talk about it in the next panel. But then you hear this great, this great breadth of this, this broad power that Tom talked about. It's not just the embassy or the diplomat, but it's spread throughout a community in every little tiny village and every little tiny tuchel group of three or four little houses that people feel the caring and the compassion. It happened to be America who led on it, but it was really a global effort. Uh, we, did a, we did PEPFAR and we did the Global Fund, which the U.S. led on that as well, but then there were 30 or 40 other countries who participated in that Global Fund and they worked in sync. So it was the caring and the compassion of humanity that people felt. This using medicine or health for diplomacy, strategic diplomacy, is a, is a real thing. And I, and I mentioned in my sort of lifetime, I was spending a lot of time in Africa, I've always said medicine is a currency for peace. And our, our military might is ultimate. I mean, the military might for the world is just absolutely protective of our freedoms, protective of our democracy. But what I think we increasingly realize, because of the success of this government-led but broad, bipartisan, people-supported, both in America and outside of America, is that caring and compassion and health can be a true currency for, for peace and understanding. Because you got your military might protecting all the freedoms and all, but on the ground, you have some sort of aid coming in that saves the life of your child for a dollar and fifty cents. And it comes from some people you don't know. That breeds faith in humanity. And yes, the source of most of it, or half of it, comes, comes from America. But that using medicine. You don't go to war with somebody who has just saved the life of your child. You don't do it. It, it, it. So it all fits together using caring and compassion as strength, just like we use military as strength. Given that this was so effective, what are some of the other public health threats that might benefit from a U.S. investment that strengthens strategic health diplomacy? Well, Bill, Bill can probably talk about it much more than I, but I, I would say that uh, we've already seen uh, the impact that, uh, that this, this uh, extraordinary effort has made with our ability to cope with Ebola. Uh, a couple yeah, of years yeah. ago. That was, uh, I think we applied a lot of the lessons learned from PEPFAR to what we, what we were challenged by with Ebola. Um, we've, we've also been able to see where HEP, HEP B and HEP C efforts, in, especially in Africa, have been able to, uh, to be more successfully addressed as a result of, of this effort. Even non-communicable diseases like diabetes and, uh, uh, and heart disease. And then, uh, and here I defer to Bill especially, but, but even with cervical cancer 
problems that we're now witnessing because of the early efforts to, uh, uh, to detect and then treat uh, HIV and AIDS, uh, we're, we're able to detect more capably um, those who might be uh, also afflicted with uh, cervical cancer. So there's just an enormous array of other illnesses that we can address because we've been able to set up the infrastructure, because we've been able to, to take the lessons learned over the last 15 years and apply them to other instances as well. You know, sometimes people argue that we need to spend more money on health systems instead of vertical programs. Yeah. PEPFAR made a lot of difference with health systems, right? Yeah. I mean, it increased professionalism and standards yeah, and that, a lot of other it's things. unbelievably, unbelievable right. story. And that's why these 15-year retrospectives with new information and new examination analyses are so important to, to Tom and me and the BPC. Um, we came in because we had this little KG virus. I said it's like you're constantly changing, so you can't hook a molecule onto it and kill it. It still can't be cured today. Kind of interesting. We still got to cure it. Um, and the goal has got to be to contain it. And that's sort of what we're doing and why this continued funding is, is, is necessary. We started with the virus, PEPFAR, President's Emergency Fund for AIDS. That's one little virus, $60 billion spent, more than anybody in history. The Global Fund, the sort of side fund at the exact same time, and President Bush, and you played a big role of it in, in that, we were the largest single first, we were the first gift, the largest gift to the Global Fund. That expanded it to HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. Other infectious diseases, at the time HIV was killing three million a year, tuberculosis two million, malaria a million a year. Now for HIV, AIDS, we cut age-related deaths down to 50% of what it is. But what happened, my, Michael, and you just said it right, when you come in and you're gonna have an antiretroviral or uh, nivirapine, which costs a dollar to save a baby, you have to set up a system. You have to set up a system of delivery, of compliance. You don't take it one time and go away, of compliance, of ongoing, of surveillance, of people coming back in. The whole testing of it was revolutionized in tests, which would cost $300 down to about $2. You had to set up an infrastructure, 11 million orphans. A mom who has HIV AIDS would give birth to a baby with HIV. You put a dollar nivirapine in there, it doesn't happen, but somebody has to identify the mom, set up the infrastructure, go into the community, and oh, while you're there, you have other issues of maternal and child health. And it might be breastfeeding, it might be early detection of other diseases, it might come into a clinic. So all of a sudden this huge infrastructure gets built on this single little virus expanded to other infectious diseases and then an infrastructure broadly set which ultimately saves countless other lives. If we say, if we say maybe 20 million lives have been saved so far by this investment, and that's conservative, probably five to six times that have been saved because of this broad infrastructure that it has to be set for the diagnosis, delivery, and treatment of those, that initial therapy. It's amazing to go to hospitals in Rwanda that used to be overwhelmed with AIDS cases and now can do diabetes and heart right. disease because and it's cancer. under control. And Even cancer. cancer. No, exactly. Um, we've seen from the 2019 House and Senate Appropriations Bill that there is still bi strong bipartisan support for HEP PEPFAR and other critical health uh, efforts. Let me read you a quote from your former colleague, U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham, who is chair of the Senate um, State and Foreign Operations Appropriations Subcommittee. He said of the 2019 bill, this bill makes America safer by supporting critical diplomatic efforts around the world, providing security assistance for our allies, directing stabilization assistance for areas in chaos due to conflict, and supporting life-saving health and humanitarian assistance to people in dire need. Now is not the time for retreat. This bill signals to the world that America is not backing away from its role as leader of the free world. In an era of America first, why does that leadership remain important? I would say it remains even more important perhaps now than ever, in part because the world is, is in such chaos. You've got 25 failed countries. Uh, you've got an enormous challenge on virtually every continent. And I think American leadership, uh, especially in this context, has never been more, more critical. I, you know, Secretary Mattis uh, said it succinctly once. He said, you cut back on funding for programs like this, I'm gonna have to buy more ammunition.
And I think that's a succinct way of saying that there is a direct correlation between the stability we can create through good health and good economic growth and support at the local level and what we're going to what ultimately we have to look at uh, from our national security perspective, regardless of the continent. So small investment, big results. And we've seen that now for 15 years. This arguably could be the single most important investment we can make to overall stability worldwide, especially in parts of the world that we don't have a very strong military or diplomatic presence today. Mike, I'd, I'd add, um, and you opened with it, that this has been bipartisan from day one, from day one. It didn't start. Actually, in our early years, it didn't. It was very kind of partisan. And this was, and Tom mentioned it, it was hugely stigmatized. It was a, an entity, a condition that was pushed off to the side. I remember Jesse Helms writing an article, I think it was for the New York Times, you probably remember it, basically saying this is something we just don't need to be dealing about initially. And then about four months later, after the American people spoke, after Republicans and Democrats spoke, after the faith-based community came on board and said, Three million people dying of a single virus every year. Eleven million orphans out there. We've got to act. Bono from U2, who and was at a concert the other night, and, and talked to him afterwards. And again, he played a huge role in saying America is great. America is lead. He can be critical of America too. And this is the single greatest thing this country has ever done. That kind of image from from the outside, not ever done, but ever done in the healthcare field. But to put it in perspective. We're talking about, if this is the budget, we're talking about everything we've just talked about being this much. All global health is about one quarter of 1% of our nation's budget, one quarter of 1%. We've talked about GDP, reputation, national security, America first, which in our document, if you read it, you'll see the four principles of America first that are outlined, and maybe the next panel will get into it, of Tre President Trump. We meet every one of those principles, different language, but we meet every one of those principles uh, coming forward. One quarter, uh, but, but the issue does boil down to this, we, which we point out in the report. If it's only one quarter of 1% that goes to all global health, not just HIV AIDS, but all global health, and if it really is a currency for peace, and if it really is a national security issue, and an issue of individual well-being where people can provide for their children and give them hope for the first time in, in 20 and 30 years, if it is all that, why is it that our administration right now comes back and says, let's cut that global fund by 30%? Why is it that the administration right now says, let's cut it by 12%? Now, luckily, the Congress has come back and essentially given it flat level funding for the last four years, which is good in this environment overall. It's about flat, so we've come back every time. But now is not the time to step back. Now is not the time to have an administration cut global health when we have this 15-year history of positive, constructive, broad, yes, global benefit of being able to cut the deaths related to HIV AIDS in half in less than by that 15 years. We have time for a few questions, but we only ask that you ask your questions in the form of a question. So. <laughs> I think a microphone is coming. a microphone here. coming. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. My name is Olivia Landau. I'm with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, I'm wondering how PEPFAR and the Bush administration dealt with um, South African former President Mbeki's opposition to ARVs and HIV denialism. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the question is, at the time, it, we had countries and uh, recipient countries with high HIV AIDS who basically from a, I can't say from what standpoint, but the narrative was that antiretrovirals don't work, that HIV AIDS is not caused by a single virus. Didn't really say what it was. It was called, it was called wasting disease at the time. And when I first started going to Africa in the 90s, nobody knew what it was, everybody was dying, they called it wasting disease because you were wasting. So what we did at the time is, and this is a pretty interesting part of the story, Michael Gerson's the expert up here, by the way, now. He, he, he wrote a lot with the president to articulate this. But what the president did before was sent Tony Fauci, our head scientist in the United States of America for infectious disease, but before even the announcement, sent Tony Fauci to Africa. 
and basically said, what is the science? I, don't, I forgot him. I was down there for, like, for a couple of weeks. And he came back, again, this is before the State of the Union, and basically said, Mr. President, this can be done. The naysayers out there, including the leaders in Africa, are wrong. It is caused by a virus. If we mobilize American industry, if we make it a public-private partnership, if we put, at that time it was about $15 billion over five years into it, I can promise you, based on science, I let me say I promise, I can pledge to you based on science that we can diminish the cost and reduce the burden on this disease and cut it in, in half. It came back to science, so plowed straight ahead. But remember, you had recipient countries that said, America, the West, stay out of our business. It's not caused by a virus, and the antiretrovirals don't work. What we did is relied on science and the best of our industry and creativity and drove straight through it. I do just, remember. Just, oh, oh, go, go ahead, please, no, you, no, I please. was just going to say, just to complete that thought, I would say it's the results. And then Becky became convinced once he saw the results. And the results were happening all around him. And it took a while. But I think that really had, to Bill's point, once you had the science and then you had the results, it was hard to deny uh, how you could uh, do the same in your own country. What do you remember those times? You were right about right. it. Well, I would only add, though, that um, you know, I remember sitting at a, at a lunch next to a health, South African health official who, thought, who told me that AIDS could be cured with garlic. Yeah. Okay. And you had this element. But beneath that, there were a lot of really good health people in South Africa that knew what was going on. Okay? You had some leadership problems, but you had a real health uh, bureaucracy that, that, was, that didn't hold these views. And you had countries like Uganda. Right. And again, those of you who are familiar, Uganda came forward where the first lady of Uganda went on the equivalent of television at the exact same time and said our country, and that was before we had really good treatment, but through VCT, Voluntary Counseling and Testing, HIV fell, plummeted there, people began to live. So you had countering countries with that voice. And Uganda was probably on the forefront at that time Absolutely. where the president and the first lady were out front. Let's get another question here. We go over this side maybe. My name is Embry Howell. I work at the Urban Institute. And um, I was curious about the connection between um, condoms or prevention method and the political issues around uh, family planning and condoms from uh, perhaps religious groups and others, and um, how I you dealt with that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in there. First of all, I don't know whether the answer historically or, or sort of present, but what it was at the time is this. Um, we knew people were dying, so we had to give Michael again was the one, not just dying, but suffering in, in, around the world, and had to give voice to the reality of what, what that was. The answer, remember, at the time, we didn't know very much about antiretrovirals, and we knew they cost $100,000, and this whole idea of applying it. What we, what we and our scientists and our industry told us that if we came together, we could get the price down. So the therapy end of it, everybody can rally behind, but therapy with five people, you know, walking in with HIV every day, there's no way to be able to get enough therapy to all of them with the number of people who are dying. People were just coming on board. So the only real answer was the prevention end of it, even to this day. Right now, we've, we've, we've cut it way down, but it's prevention. Prevention, we know abstinence works, right? So that's, you know, that's kind of obvious. Number two would be we know that birth control condoms protection work. So what, what we did, because you had Democrats and you had Republicans, you had evangelical, you had faith-based, why did the faith-based community come on board even though some of them were very much against condoms, an element of birth control? And basically what, from a government policy standpoint, we didn't get that involved with that. We basically had to, certain parts had to be watered down just a little bit to get the coalition that was there. And we basically brought in a faith-based community and said, do you go about it the way you want? If you want the ABCs, you push that forward, but support that legislation. If you want, that's some kind of, I won't go to the ABCs, but you can either say you're for condoms, against condoms as part of it. But we left it broad enough. At that point in time, a lot of people didn't realize we were distributing, at that point in time, more condoms than any country in the world already uh, at, at that point in time. And that's how it was handled. And then people came on board. If people didn't believe in antiretroviral therapies are going to cost too much, they could still come on board. If people didn't believe, believe in using condoms, 
uh, just the ABs, just the throw faith and the abstinence part of it, just the belief and the abstinence part of it, still come on board. And that's how that coalition was developed. Okay. Let's do one more question, maybe in the back. Can we? My name's Sabrina, and I'm with um, Malaria No More. And I was just wondering what you thought of the future in U.S. investments in relation to global health security and the reemergence of, for example, polio in Venezuela and the upturn in malaria cases in the Americas. Cute. I'll jump in just real quick, just in, in, Tom and Mike, you ought to comment. Um, the reason this funding has to be, this isn't a thing that's cured and goes away. We have two issues, and you brought up one that we should have mentioned really earlier, and that is, which is one of the big ones, the reason why I have to, we have to continue to invest or this will come back. We do not have a cure. We do not have a cure for HIV AIDS. Malaria, a little bit different. Malaria is mainly kills children. And again, just so people will know, but it was very much part of the global fund and malaria no more are coming. The, the thing that you brought up is the resistance to current therapies today, whether it's malaria or tuberculosis or HIV, you had this emergence of resistance. So you'd be given a antiretroviral or you'd be given an anti-malarial drug and all of a sudden this malaria evolves and it no longer works. So we have to have the continued research coming in. The other big issue that we talk about in the report is this resurgence of young people in Africa today. Yeah. And as that resurgence of young people, they need to be, they need to both receive that education because culturally, if you're not receiving that education in some way, again, those same sort of behaviors with that virus for which there is no cure yet would come right back. I would just add that I think we've mentioned a couple of times now the importance of the infrastructure that we've created. And that infrastructure is so vital as we go forward and, uh, and take the lessons learned. There's a new concept that is oftentimes referred to as data diplomacy, uh, using data for purposes of, of applying what we now know, the infrastructure that we now have, uh, to address the challenges that we now face. And I don't think... Uh, anyone can fully appreciate the magnitude of that contribution uh, because it's hard to document in a, in a macroeconomic fashion. But it's there. It's real. And uh, data diplomacy and transparency and the, the kind of qualities and values and tools that we brought to this challenge are very applicable as we look to the next 15 years. We have to apply them just as effectively as we've done in the past. We have to conclude there, but I want to thank Senator Daschle and Senator Frist for 15 years of leadership in the cause of compassion and American leadership. So please join me in thanking them. Thank you.